Is sequencing the SARS-CoV-2 genome useful for patient care? Is it useful for infection control? And if clinical labs decide to perform SARS-CoV-2 sequencing, how should they do it? How should they report it? And who's going to pay for this? Until recently, sequencing of SARS-CoV-2 genomes has mainly been done in public health or research laboratories. But now there's increasing interest in sequencing the viral genome in healthcare settings for uses in patient care and infection control. We'll be talking about a new guideline that can help clinical labs and institutions decide whether to perform SARS-CoV-2 sequencing. Welcome to Editors in Conversation. This episode is brought to you by the Journal of Clinical Microbiology, available at jcm.asm.org and on Twitter at jclinmicro. I'm your host, JCM Editor-in-Chief Alex McAdam. This podcast is supported by the American Society for Microbiology, which publishes JCM. I'm joined by two guests to discuss sequencing of SARS-CoV-2. First, Dr. Francesca Lee. Welcome, Frankie. Can you introduce yourself? Yeah, thank you for inviting me. I'm very excited to be here. So I am at UT Southwestern in Dallas, Texas. I am an adult clinical infectious disease uh, physician, and I also did a clinical microbiology fellowship. And so I have a dual appointment. Um, I'm actually now primarily appointed under the Department of Pathology, and I serve as one of the co-directors for our hospital's micro lab, as well as the um, a technical director for the pre-analytical services. So basically all the phlebotomists and processors and everybody, I wear those two hats and then I see patients in the hospital. <laughs> it sounds like you're pretty busy. Thanks for taking the time to, to join us. Yeah. And we're also joined again by our friend, Alex Greninger. Alex, glad to have you back. This is your second or third time, I think. Uh, tell us second. where you are. Second time. Uh, tell us yeah, where you are and time. what you do. Uh, so I'm in Seattle, Washington at the University of Washington Medical Center. And I'm the assistant director of the uh, clinical virology there. Um, so a lot of clinical testing, and then, of course, uh, we also do a lot of clinical trials work as well. Yep, and a lot of research, right? Yep. Yeah. Uh, so Alex and Frankie are the first and last authors of a paper that's in press at JCM. Uh, the title of the paper is Clinical and Infection Prevention Applications of SARS-CoV-2 Genotyping. And this is a joint consensus review document from the Infectious Diseases Society of America and the American Society for Microbiology. So it's being published in JCM, and it'll also be published in Clinical Infectious Diseases. And we'll put a link to the accepted manuscript in the show notes, the JCM version, that is. And before we get into the content of the paper, Frankie, you were telling us a little bit about how the paper came together and how the group worked together. Uh, and I thought that was pretty interesting. Can you can you tell us about that? Yeah. So um, we started this as a, a collaborative effort, obviously, between members of IDSA and ASM. Um, there's the IDSA has a diagnostics committee that um, a number of the authors are members on. Alex is now also included in that. Um, and this was something that everybody really wanted to tackle. Um, and we were trying to figure out how to put together a document that would be helpful for laboratorians, but also that they could also use to try to present information to leadership at their institutions. Um, and that could be helpful for public health and then also still be understandable to clinicians. And so I think if you look at the author list, uh, we have a pretty fair representation of all of those interests. Um, but the thing that was really neat is that, you know, Alex really uh, gets massive credit for really spearheading this and, and doing the lion's share of um, the work and laying the foundation. But then all of the authors really came together and wrote this super quickly. I mean, uh, we're talking about weeks. I mean, I think I, I think it took no more than two months to get this whole paper together with all of these different authors lending their expertise and um, and uh, being able to get it to the point of submission for publication. So it was a really, I think, fun experience for for all of us. To do. That's great. And and it, we, when you were saying Alex, you meant Alex Greninger. We're going to have yes, to. Yes, yes. Sorry. I mean, this you're going cool like, to This is going to be like school. school. We're going to have to have Alex G and Alex M. That's why I'm never invited. <laughs> <laughs> um, all right, Alex, let's start with you. A couple of questions for you to, to get things going. And Frankie, jump in at any time, please. Okay. Um, so I think listeners are familiar with the idea that mutations accumulate in the viral genome of SARS CoV 2. Um, and that determines the, or is associated with the type of the virus and lots of other things that we're going to talk about. Can you tell us a little bit about the rate of evolution of SARS-CoV-2 and contrast it to other RNA viruses? Yeah. So, um, I mean, there's been a lot of work on this recently. I'm actually probably not as up to date on everything that comes out all the time as there's more and more and more data, um, that comes out for SARS-CoV-2. I mean, uh, so it's, it's not necessarily as fast as uh, like HIV. It's, I mean, the general thought was sort of basically about a, on a consensus level, you see about a mutation every two weeks. Um, you know, coronaviruses uh, do sort of temper their evolution um, a little bit uh, because they're so large and they have such a large open reading frame um, that they can't just sort of go crazy uh, over those 30 KB or 29 KB. Um, but uh, it's, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's been, I mean, for a lot of people, it's just been, uh, 
sufficiently fast as to be interesting, especially in the last you know year year and a half here um, from a from a, a rate standpoint. But I'm not going like, to get into like you know the numbers of substitutions per site per year or anything like that. Um, but certainly, what we've seen, you know, I think we've also appreciated. Actually, it was sort of percolating in the literature. This is kind of things from SARS-CoV-2. You can look back and you can see this work. You know, sort of the accelerated um, evolutionary rates in immunocompromised patients over longitudinal infections, and then if those do get transmitted, um, certainly for like B117 or Alpha when it first came out, uh, it was sort of on a different line, as it were, of evolution. I mean, it evolved at the same rate, but it had been almost like a stepwise function. Almost like if you go back to the original sort of like uh, dinosaur bones, sort of like evolutionary, like the sort of continuous versus like stepwise, it had sort of like almost gone through a phase change in terms of how many mutations had accumulated. And we've certainly seen that in some of these variants of, of, of interest and variants of concern, um, which has sort of led to this provocative hypothesis that uh, they could be coming out of immunocompromised individuals. Um, but anyway, so it's a, a lot of things going on there, which is why I think it's important to keep this information close to patient, um, patient clinical information, and if possible, patient care. So let's let's back up for just a sec. You mentioned that that um, I can't remember exactly how you said it, but that SARS-CoV-2 is somewhat more stringent in in controlling well, mutations that accumulate in its genome. How how does it do that compared to other RNA viruses? Well, coronaviruses writ large, um, they have a, a, a friend, an exo uh, nucleus, an SP14. It's sort of like a little proofreader. Yeah. Um, the polymerase complex is quite quite large um, for this virus, um, and so it it comes along and and, and sort of is you know, thought to sort of proofread. Uh, the mistakes that a classic sort of RNA dependent RNA polymerase uh, would make a, a lot of mutations. Um, and this allows, this is what we thought what allows the nidoviruses or which are part coronaviruses are part of the nidoviruses um, to, to, uh, to uh, have such large genome sizes. You have such a large genome size, you, you, you're not, you, you can't have such high evolutionary rate because you'll make a mess and, and junk one of the proteins. Um, so our, our RNA viruses that are even smaller, like the coronaviruses or even like HIV, can get away with a higher mutation rate. And I also think that one of the, obviously one of the major differences for HIV is that it's a retrovirus, so it can book its gains over time. It's always writing to the hard drive, while coronavirus kind of has to work with what's actively templated all the time. By writing to the hard drive for HIV, you mean integration into the- Integration, genome? yeah. It gets to book, the, every single mutation is written to you know, a place that can emerge later if it wants gotcha. to, if it's, if it's advantageous. Gotcha. Um, all right, so let's, let's go on and just remind us if you would please, Alex, um, remind us of the nomenclature around variants because we're going to be using it. So the variants of interest, of concern, et cetera. What, what, break that down for us. Yeah. So, um, uh, well, certainly there have been a lot of different nomenclatures for variants over the last year. You've got the Pango lineages, you've got next, uh, next clade, next train uh, lineage numbers, and then they sort of came together and had these uh, WHO Greek letters, uh, alpha, beta, gamma, delta. I forget how far we are now um, in the Greek alphabet only mildly compl complicated because I, I've been in a couple situations now in viral discovery where you have alpha coronaviruses, beta coronaviruses, gamma, delta uh, coronaviruses, and sometimes that'll actually like uh, affect, those are like, you know, genera levels, but way farther up the evolutionary tree, but sometimes these um, uh, strains, uh, sort of variants of concern, variants of interest will come up. From a, from a definition of variant concern, variant of interest, a uh, variant of concern has basically shown the ability uh, to um, be more, uh, uh, to spread better in human populations and to um, be potentially have, uh, and have resistance to drugs like uh, in, a, in, a, in a more, in a, or evade vaccines, but it's shown the ability to do that. Variants of interest often have, um, you know, uh, these, you can see these properties potentially in a dish, but they haven't really done it on a population wide level to really sort of show that they're going to um, take over. Uh, and so, you know, for the that's that's why I sort of think of the the variant of interest, variant of concern, um, definition, and difference. Is, is it fair to say that a variant of interest might cause trouble, but a variant of concern yeah. has been shown to cause trouble? Right, exactly. It's sort of variant of concern is above variant of interest. And then there's this category that has no members right now: variants of high consequence. Yeah, I think that people have been, you know, hesitant to move things above variant of concern, um, uh, or, you know, so that's basically where people have, have, have thought, I mean, it's, it's crazy to think, sorry, just to step back here a second as we're here yeah. in November to like, just even go back just like even six months uh, or, or, or seven months from where we were with all of the different lineages coming along. We've been quite long for a long time now where Delta has basically taken over, yeah. um, you know, on a sort of a, a Greek nomenclature level in that grouping. And now it's a question of sort of which Delta is going to take over. So I think, you know, we always exist at these moments where 
you know, ex post, you're like, oh, okay, that's what happened. This we can explain it with some, you know, science and some cryo EM and some entry assays and whatnot. But, you know, talking about what's going to come next as well, you know, we're, we're, we've been in this moment now for several months where like nobody knows what comes next. Um, other than we just need to get a lot more people vaccinated. I, I could not agree more. Um, get your vaccine folks and get your booster if you haven't got it yet. Amen. Yeah. Um, all right, Alex, let's start talking a, li a little bit about the genotyping methods. And if I were going to try to set up um, SARS-CoV-2 genotyping in my lab, um, the first thing I would do is hire somebody who actually knew how to do it. But setting that aside, um, what would I have to know in terms of regulatory status? Can I go out and buy an FDA approved kit to do this? I, I love my FDA approved kit. Can I get one? You, all right, you love. I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that they send you a Valentine so they can return the favor. Um, <laughs> I didn't say I love the FDA. Uh, <laughs> oh, yeah, I it, yeah, your FDA approved kit. That's right. It's only it's a hop, skip, and a jump from the FDA. Um, anyway, uh, no, uh, so there is no um, FDA authorized EUA cleared any of that business um, for, for, for genotyping at this moment. Um, so, you know, that's not been something there's not even a, there's not even like a, uh, like sort of like a white paper or like a guideline for like how they would, um, uh, authorize or approve those that I'm, that I'm aware of. Um, so, right, so always, I'm, I'm taking on that whole regulatory burden. If I do this, this is a yeah. laboratory developed test. It's I a laboratory developed test. Yep. All right. So I, I still want to do it. I still want to go ahead. <laughs> what are my choices in terms of methods and what are the sort of uh, pluses and minus for each of those options. Yeah, so you basically have to right out the right out of the gates. You basically have sort of a decision whether you want to do sort of an allele specific, you know, qPCR based method, which labs a lot of labs, especially genetics labs, are well familiar with this from 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 human uh, uh, human variants before. Um, so you know you can uh, try to uh, make an allele specific qPCR, and yeah, you'd want probably like a PhD level scientist in the lab or someone with experience in developing molecular assays. Uh, to sort of, you know, make, there, there are many different ways of doing this um, uh, from different probe, uh, you know, where the mismatch is and um, snap wrap primers and different different genotype. There are many different ways to solve this problem from an allele qPCR standpoint, allele specific qPCR. Uh, the advantage of allele specific qPCR is it's fast, um, right? So it's, you get the result as you do the qPCR. Um, the downside is that it's, it's, and it's, it's cheap too, it's either a good thing. But mm -hmm. the downside is that it's targeted. Um, so, you know, specifically during this last year, and a lot of people that came out with allele specific qPCRs, and that includes uh, commercial groups. Again, didn't get them to the FDA, but there are things that you can buy from, I think, from uh, Thermo. Uh, I think C Gene has, there are many different companies that have kits like that that can do this. Um, you know, they had to deal with alpha, they had to deal with epsilon, maybe for a different geography, they had to deal with potentially beta, then they had to deal with delta. Um, and so they had to sort of update these as they went along um, uh, for, for different mutations. The advantage also, too, is that, you know, um, uh, for as, as important as it is to assign lineages, it's also really important to detect specific mutations that have shown um, uh, resistance uh, to monoclonal therapy uh, or, or so sort of that, you know, that's really the major one for clinical use is, is resistance to monoclonal therapy. Uh, so if you can detect those specific mutations, in some ways, it doesn't really matter whether it occurs in the background of a delta or an alpha plus or beta or whatever. You know, it's 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 going to, you know, suggest that there's a, a decreased efficacy for that for that monoclonal for that for that therapy. And so, that, right, so that's a helpful piece. OK, so my, if, yeah. I, if I choose a little specific PCR, I am depending on my my primers or my probes um, to detect specific mutations. Right. Yeah. And I like it because it's fast. I like it because it's cheap. But the downside is that if there are additional mutations, uh, new mutations that my probes or primaries won't catch, I'm going to miss them. Yeah. Okay. And, and you're also only detecting a handful of mutations. So from an epidemiological standpoint, when it comes to infection prevention, you're a little less able to sort of get, you're not getting the whole genome. So you're not yeah. being able to sort of assign, you know, recent time to recent common ancestor in like the last couple of weeks or whatever. Is it a handful because I can only because of the extent to which I can multiplex? Is that what's exactly? I mean, there are some dumb, some groups trying to come out with like you know twenty four well or you know half a. I mean, that's so large. You know, very very. You check a lot of different mutations, but it yeah. takes that many wells. So now you're talking about running in three eighty four wells, which a lot of clinical labs are not really used to running. All right, all right. So that's my that's my first my first uh, possibility. I like some things about it, but I I don't like the fact that it's not comprehensive, and I don't like the fact that I'm going to miss new stuff. So yep. what's, my, what's my next choice? I mean, 
so your next choice is, is whole genome sequencing. Um, and, and there, I mean, you could actually do targeted sequencing with specific, like you could just sequence spike. That's also a possibility. So if you just wanted to sequence RBD or receptor binding domain or a certain locus, but you know, well, now there are what, what are the, what are the pluses and minuses to doing that? To so do if you sequence, if you sequence, for instance, so if you're focused on like receptor binding domain or, or, or parts of spike, then you'll have that information for the monoclonals. Um, but again, it's a small locus. So now all of a sudden, if, you know, next week the FDA authorizes molnupiravir or, you know, Pfizer's a Paxlovid, uh, then you're, you're not, you don't have any information in terms of like from proteases or, or, or RNA dependent RNA polymerases, as well as you're only getting a small locus. So you're not able to get the whole genome from an epidemiological standpoint, but it does allow you to assign lineages, um, uh, with, with more confidence than maybe just a handful of mutations and uh, that you get from allele specific PCR. And it is relevant for those monoclonal therapies. So that's that's one one option that people have. But the thing is now, most people will do in the same workflow as they would have done uh, sequencing a, a single locus. You can sequence the whole genome with these um, tiling amplicon PCR panels, which a number of, I mean, I think Thermo has one, uh, Illumina, COVIDseq makes one, uh, Swift and IDT have one. Um, Wait, so, 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 so hang, let me, let me get cut up. So. If I do, if I do the targeted sequencing, I'm only going to get a chunk of the genome, right? Whatever yeah. I amplified and then sequenced, and I could do spike or whatever I whatever I want. I'll find every mutation in there, right? So that's yep. good. But what you're saying is, I may as well do whole genome sequencing. Yeah, it's the same I, workflow, and I'll I'll get the whole thing. Right. Exactly. Okay. I think that's really you, you've seen very few people doing that very small level, uh, small locus of sequencing. So. You get the whole genome, you do these Amplicon tiling platforms, which basically take like 200. So it's the same idea as doing a single PCR. You're just doing them in mass across the entire genome and breaking up into little like 200 MERS or 300 MERS and having those PCRs tile across the genome. Uh, and then uh, you sort of get like a schmear of PCR products uh, when, you, um, uh, when you run it on a gel. Uh, and uh, But then you can either ligate adapters or fragment it and put it on a, a next gen sequencer. Um, and again, because you can get away with this because the virus has evolved so little in so many places. I mean, this is not like, like HIV or like rhinovirus or many of the other viruses that spread in human populations for a long time, because you can land primers in many different places across the genome with basically 100, near 100% 100 conservation across most of the sequence strains. So you can, you can do these, these high throughput uh, uh, amplicon tiling platforms and then there are many different software packages as well. Some actually, I mean, I think Thermo actually takes care of that informatic portion for you to basically reassemble uh, the genome and you can um, you know, upload that to GISAID or to NCBI, but you also can take that data and look at the specific mutations associated with um, uh, monoclonal resistance, uh, sort of vaccine escape uh, to um, uh, the, the, if, if there are mutations that come out for the, the new um, orally bioavailable drugs uh, that come out. So, you know, it's, that, that's, what's nice. It's comprehensive. So you won't have to change your workflow. You know, we validated, uh, a pipeline like over a year ago for this, and we're still using the same thing. And, and so that stability is quite nice. Um, you could also, you know, go into other ideas for ways to recover genomes. You can shotgun sequence metagenomics, but which is nice and comprehensive works for any RNA virus or many viruses, but the limited detection is not great. You probably won't recover like CT less than 25, 26 or greater than 25, 26. Uh, you could also do hybridization capture. Uh, so you sort of uh, order a bunch of probes across the genome and they're biotinylated, hybridize, and then sort of affinity purify uh, with those probes. That can get you to like CT 30, 31, 30 in that range. Um, and it's a nice workflow. It's a little bit more, it's, a, it's more work. So you want to get, uh, the, the, one of the problems here is that a lot, you know, compared to PCR, where there's a lot of automation sample to answer workflow, there really isn't as much of a sample to answer workflow, um, other than Thermo does have one nice instrument that sort of come out um, that can do more of a sample to answer workflow. Um, but so a lot of it is, you know, you have to buy an Illumina or a Minion or, um, you know, different sequencers, and then also have a separate, uh, a separate upstream library prep, as well as potentially doing some informatics yourself. So for many clinical labs, this is a high, a high bar, but you know, most of the academic clinical labs have genetics divisions that, you know, do this on the routine for now 10 years or more from a next gen sequencing standpoint. And so, you know, I think the first call you want to do is, you know, if you're, if you don't feel comfortable from a clinical micro lab or interested in this is, is really talk to your, your genetics colleagues, um, and, and team up. And it's a great op opportunity to do that, to, to team up between clinical micro, clinical virology and genetics. 
That's a great. That's a great point. I want to go back to to something you mentioned because um, it went by kind of quickly. Um, break it down for us in terms of viral load. Which of these methods will fail with low viral load? Let's start there. Uh, so the Amplicon tiling has the best analytical sensitivity um, because of the it has whole genome of all of them because it of 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 of, of all the different routes you can. Well, sorry. Okay. Let me let me let me think back. Let me think about. Yeah. Sorry. Allele specific PCR has the best analytical sensitivity because it's one single small amplicon there. Okay. Uh, so we, you probably could do that. It's like a PCR. So it's what the limit detection of PCR is. Basically, CT thirty six is where you start to get away from like ninety five percent detection in a PCR. Usually, generally speaking, amplicon tiling is actually pretty similar um, because you can get those uh, uh, small fragments um, of just across the genome. So just the problem is you're trying to do it across all the genomes. So certain parts might drop out and. You know, we can talk about what constitute a whole genome. According to the CDC, it's 90%. If you can get 90% of the genome, that's, you know, getting a whole genome. They'll pay you for it. Um, if it's above 90%, they won't. 90% is an A. That's right. Exactly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, so anyway, um, but uh, so there you can get limit detection close to like sort of 33, 34 in that range, about 95%. And uh, But certainly if you're just doing shotgun sequencing, that limit detection is going to be like, you know, CT 25, 26, you're going to need almost a million copies there because you're amplifying all the RNA. Uh, and so then you need to know a way or, or hybridization capture, like I said, maybe a CT 30 about in the tens of thousands of copies. So there is, there are definitely a lot of, I mean, many of the qPCrs can detect uh, viral loads that are not easily recoverable by sequencing. And I'd say uh -huh. many labs, many labs have, uh, will say, we're not even going to try and sequence something CT greater than 30. A lot of labs just say that as a clean cutoff and say, okay, it's not worth it. We, we, say, that, do, we say that here. I'm sorry, Frankie. Yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, what do you advise um, to labs whose diagnostic platforms do not provide CT values? Uh, get a diagnostic platform that provides CT values, first thing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Uh, you know, um, well, you want to, so you want to cheat. I mean, so the thing you could do, you can epidemiologically cheat, right? Which is if, uh, if you're on an upswing of, of infection or you can, or, you know, the time to symptom onset or time to mm -hmm. symptom onset, then, um, you can sort of, you can sort of figure out about what, what you think ballpark, what the CT is, you know, there'll be really stronger viral loads earlier in the upswing because there's more recent transmission. If it's more recent times and symptom onset, they're going to be higher viral loads as well. Uh, but ultimately, got to quant it. I mean, that's just that, that's actually part of the most of the sequencing workflow. Mm -hmm. Or you can just go for it and look look at you know the QC of what what the um, uh, uh, what, whether you get amplicons there. If there's amplicons, then you can sequence it. So, all right, that that is super helpful. I have a few more questions before I decide which of these systems I'm going to bring in. Honestly, um, all, all, these, all these questions, next questions go to Frankie. So yeah, <laughs> this is the last one for you. Um, what about turnaround time for these for, for these different choices? Yeah, so that's so allele specific PCR has a much faster turnaround time. I mean, turnaround time for everything depends on the batch size, right? So none of these yeah. are going to be sampled to answer random access. So we're not talking about three hours unless you want to commit to it. So, you know, obviously you can do an LDT PCR uh, in same day um, if you wanted to. Um, it just depends on if you have the volume and what's coming through, what, what sort of other uses are going on for that and what you can batch it with. Uh, so, so it could, you know, allele specific PCR is the possibility of being same day. Uh, to next day. Um, for the whole genome sequencing, you know, I think a lot of groups uh, will sort of cite like seven to 10 days, uh, potentially, depending on the batch size number of samples coming through. Um, and so, you know, uh, we like, we'll, we'll quote basically probably about seven to 10, like think about 10 days or something like that. A lot of the time is actually just getting the sample here between labs. So that's part yep. of it too. But yeah, so that's a big, that's a big downside to uh, genotyping and um, given the large batch sizes from the, the, the sequencers is that it does take about, probably about seven days. If you wanted to push it, I mean, like if you, you put a, you put a gun to our head or you give us a big, you know, a big reason to do it, then, you know, we can get, we can, you can do the workflow uh, in the samples from starting to getting on the sequencer and have the results out in a day and a half if you want to push. Um, the problem is just really getting all the samples, getting all the cats herded, you know, onto the, the plate to basically uh, make it sort of cost effective um, from that standpoint. But it yeah. probably, I mean, so that's the workflow. That, that's I appreciate you being very realistic about it. You see these papers occasionally saying we did whole genome sequencing of this bacterium or this virus and it only took us 36 hours. And that's why it's great. Yeah, but it completely neglects all kinds of real world stuff, uh, transport yeah. time, batching. 
Yeah. yeah, absolutely. And I think it's, but I think it's important to show what's possible too. I mean, I think a lot of those papers are like, you know, what's possible. And certainly now you've seen this actually in the neonatal, you know, sequencing world uh, that they're increasingly, you know, able to hit those turnaround times in clinical standpoint. So it really just depends upon um, the prioritization, the incentivization, and sort of the, and, and, and what the, where the technology is currently. So you can, you can do it faster and that's important. But again, the question is, and that's what this whole conversation is about is, you know, where does it fit into the priority of the clinical mm -hmm. micro lab? Yep. Yep. All right. So Frankie, Alex has convinced me to buy and set up a whole genome sequencing. That's what I'm going to go with. All and right. I get it all set up. I get my turnaround time optimized. It's a little bit more than a week. Um, and I'm ready to start using this for clinical care and for epidemiological investigations. Um, so let's start with clinical care. What what should a patient report look like? I've never reported anything this complicated. I just report CMV present or absent, and it's this many copies per you know milliliter of volume. But now I've got to report the all this complicated data. What what should I make that report look like? So in the paper, we provide two examples um, of what reports hypothetically could look like. And one is um, a very uh, focused one that I think would be more user-friendly to clinicians. And this is really um, based on detection of specific alleles and then how you would interpret that. And I think that there is a lot of precedence for this in the clinical side. So you gave the example of CMV. You know, many of us are used to actually seeing mutations for CMV that help us decide if we can use certain antivirals, you know, or, or if we're going to have to, you know, reach for um, some of the other ones. And so potentially reporting just what those amino acid changes are, you know, and detected, and then um, including interpretation or, you know, some sort of guidance to, to help guide the clinician. Um, I think that would be the most useful thing if you're trying to report something to the patient chart. And then conversely, if you're actually trying to send data to um, your infection prevention departments or to public health or things like that, that's when you could consider having a report that's much more extensive. And, uh, and that's going to be where you, you know, discuss the variant type and then you discuss, you know, issues about the actual testing mechanisms. What platforms did you use? You know, what lineage does it fall into? All that type of thing that could then be really used for those epidemiologic purposes. Mm -hmm. That information is probably not needed in a in a super acute time frame, right? Like that's where you could um, stretch out your your analysis and your reporting, and um, and so maybe you actually have a two pronged approach, or you know, sort of a double way that you report, and you take your data and maybe your initial analysis is very targeted to things that are going to matter to a clinician making decisions at the bedside about yes or no this drug, particularly as we see that mutations do correlate with resistance to to different agents. Um, versus, you know, doing more in-depth, um, extensive um, sequencing that you could then use for, um, you know, tracking of populations. And so I think that would be the way I think about it. Got it. So that's sort of a, a general approach. What mutations should I report? Should I report every mutation that I find? Yeah, that's a great question, right? And I'll, I'll go back to um, I'll go back to CM, uh, CMV again, right? And it depends on the lab that you use and how they do it. Some will only report the very specific ones that have been clearly associated with resistance to antivirals, and then others will actually give you a much broader panel of we saw all of these things. These ones are specifically reported with resistance to fuscarnet or gencyclovir or whatever. These other ones, we're not sure. We're not sure what these mean. Um, and so. Um, I think in the early days, at least, I would probably um, keep my reporting targeted to, to data that is really going to impact decision making um, and, you know, has been shown to because I think sometimes when you provide too much information that can actually cause confusion. Um, and uh, and um, and then as, you know, more things come out, I would I would expand, um, you know, in, in that reporting. But I think as it is kind of a new thing, the, the more definitive you can be in what you put out to clinicians, the more confidence they're going to have in the results you give them to. And so I, I that's probably how I would think about it. Got it. Got it. Um, Alex, you, you, you I want to add one yeah. thing. One, one, so yeah, it's the great issue is as we move more and more to whole genome sequencing for this virus and other viruses as well, you know, this is actually a, a, a true problem of how do you mm -hmm. communicate all of the things or some of the things. And so as Frankie said, we have the sort of above the line and below the line, at least in pathology for how to think about mutations. But we also have the accession number, um, which is a nice way. So if you take the data and you put it in a public database, you know, uh, de-identified, it basically still allows people can take that number. And if they, if they get interested in another area or they want to know, then that that actually is available and can travel it, travel with the, the information. So we do recommend 
um, putting accession numbers. And you see that a lot from public health. You see that from clinical labs now uh, putting the accession numbers as, as the, uh, the databases are able to accept data, make it publicly available sort of same day, next day. So I'm debating with myself whether to hassle you about accession numbers and whether they're linked to date or any other potentially identifying information. An issue well, that's a great question. Is, is close is, to your heart. Is a date a uh, is a date a part, part of, of protected health information? I mean, so we wrote a paper before yeah. showing a very simple thing, which is that most samples are collected on the date of admission or on the date you know early in in, in a hospitalization, um, and so you could actually and, and actually HHS names admission date in their definitions of protected health information. Mm. Uh, so that's what we're going for there. But again, I think for a lot of people, I think thinking thinking is sort of my thinking honestly has evolved during this pandemic, just from the standpoint of you know, you have to make this sort of helpful and for, you have to make this data helpful, a date in and of itself with a SARS-CoV-2 diagnosis when you've had, you know, millions of infections across the country and in your locale is, is you know, hard to say that that's truly identifying. Um, you know, I think from a geographic, the next sort of question is, and you know, what do you do from a geographic standpoint? Yep. And there, I think, you know, hewing quite closely to the HHS guidelines on that one is, is key. But, you know, it's like, is a singular date and a, and a SARS-CoV-2 diagnosis identifying, you know, statistically, I think you pretty much say that's not, you know, where a measles diagnosis, okay, that could maybe that's just, you're now you're collapsing the number of people involved, but you have to make sort of higher level arguments um, for that. And, but that's a one, one limit. It, that's true. It, I, I, we wrote that paper like four or five years ago, sort yeah. of saw this coming from the standpoint of how do you, you know, how the way that we talk about clinical information and what's PHI and how things go in the public health sphere, you know, there are areas and, and what academics sort of were doing at the time, uh, it, it, you could have saw this clash coming. Um, but most people still put in the, the date to the level of the day uh, uh, when, the, when, the, when the sample was collected. Um, I will, if I remember, and I'll do my best, I'll put a link into the article that you referred to. Um, Okay. Or at least the one I'm thinking of in JCM that you wrote that I hope is the one you're referring to. And if you're referring also, to another one, one uh, <laughs> in virus evolution, two or three oh. years before that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Sorry. It's okay. I'll um, send it to you. <laughs> uh, all right. So, Frankie, let's turn to the clinical use scenarios. And it, um, I think it, it may be that clinical applications will expand, but the, the uh, paper as it is now has r relatively limited potential mm -hmm. clinical applications. Can you Can you take us through that? Yeah, at the time that we wrote it, and I don't know that too much has changed. You know, there wasn't a whole lot of correlation, really definite correlation between specific mutations and um, treatment failures. You know, there's some. And, uh, you know, there was uh, one drug with, you know, an EUA revoked because of um, all of this. But uh, but in general, there's not that much. And so, you know, we, we couldn't point to anything really robust and say, like, you must use this for, you know, taking care of your patients. And if you don't, mm -hmm. you're doing them a disservice. But I think the 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 concept is is still there, right? And you you sort of don't know until you really start to look. But you know, Alex mentioned earlier that, you know, there's all these new antivirals coming onto the market and we have no idea what's gonna happen with those. And so I, I think it is important to be flexible and to be able to provide information that fundamentally as a clinician, what I need to know is, is the risk of giving a particular drug worthwhile? Um, you know, is the risk of any potential toxicities or adverse effects worthwhile? And if it turns out that you have mutations that are going to make it fail or have a high chance, then the answer is no, right? So those are the those are the pieces of information that you, you need. Um, the other uh, um, situation that we, you know, wanted to show was things like potentially cohorting. And so this was, oh, this was sorry, I'm going to jump in, Frankie, I apologize. I, I just want to go back before we go on to, to cohorting and, and other infection mm -hmm. control things. You, you mentioned that a drug was withdrawn. Um, oh, yeah, it was one of the, yeah. uh, I, I can't remember which one was it. It was one of the monoclonal Damn. antibodies. Um, Trambolizumab. Yeah, that's one thing. Yeah. I haven't used it forever, so that one. <laughs> yeah, 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 good. So, so, and that was the main application that you talked about um, in the paper was to inform monoclonal antibody therapy, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, it was pre-antivirals coming out. No, I, I yeah, exactly. And that's that's a an application that seems like it has much more potential mm -hmm. utility, right? But for mm -hmm. both of those, turnaround time is going to have to be pretty quick, right? Yeah, and that's why I think being able to determine um, somewhat quickly what mutations may or may not be associated with resistance. I mean, I think that's where targeted PCRs would actually be helpful, right? If you could de design a, a platform on the clinical side that you can turn it around in, you know, 24 hours from um, detection of the virus, that would that would be useful. 
And those are the situations where you do need quick turnaround. All right. So maybe I shouldn't have spent all that imaginary money on a whole genome sequencing system because I can just wait for the manufacturers to come out with targeted PCRs for antiviral resistance once that shows up. But that's all. Well, I mean, they, they may take their time too. So you may still beat yeah. them. <laughs> <laughs> Alex, anything to add there? I was going to ask, do they even let you have a clinical microbiology directorship in Boston if you don't have a next generation sequencing uh, instrument? Or... <laughs> <laughs> you think they you think they hand them to I mean, us? Yeah, I, I, I would say like, well, I would be worried, you know, for for malpractice, what the, the usual practice is in the community, you know, uh, that you're uh, you're not, uh, you know, I'm just kidding. I'm sorry, Alex. Uh, you know, so when I came in, they were like, Here, here's your white coat. Here's your computer. Here's your next generation yeah, sequencing yeah, setup. Exactly. If only, be, man, if know, only. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think we keep well, saying the term the the microbiology lab, um, but I just want, you know, different hospitals or different institutions are going to have different setups, right? So, for mm. example, at mine, all of this um, this sequencing work is actually done via our molecular laboratory department, which is separate from micro. So, you know, in our clinical micro lab, we have those sample to result platforms, right, that are going to be quick turnaround time for patient care. But things that are more extensive, those are all going to be done um over there, it's over there, it's a different building. Um, and so uh, uh, we work with them, you know, we, co we collaborate, but you know, they have, they have their whole different leadership structure and their, yep. you know, funding and all that kind of stuff. And so these are things that I think also have to be considered because I, I imagine we're not the only institution that's in that kind of a setup. Um, and then if you're talking about um, maybe more community-based um, uh, um, laboratories, they, they, may have even fewer resources to be able to bring these things in. So that is why I think being able to, if not the manufacturers, but even local um, uh, academic centers or places that can do it, that could have targeted detection that can help guide therapy, should that turn out to be useful? You know, that's that's where I think it, it is important because I mean, really, in, I'm the micro lab director. I don't design these things. I don't design all this sequencing stuff. I don't work with it, but, I, but people ask me questions about it all the time, you know, and so, <laughs> so I have to pay attention. <laughs> No, I, I hear you. We're we're pretty much in the same boat here, Alex. I do wish I had a next generation sequencing setup, but I don't. Um, and so it's similar. Uh, you know, we we're not doing it here. We're doing all the sort of platform based testing for you know PCR for the yeah. detection of the virus and so on. But otherwise, it's got to go someplace else. Well, Christmas um, is coming up. Yeah. so I hope you had a good year. You know. Maybe, yeah, I was maybe good. There might be something. There might Aren't be you? there might be a flongle in your in your stocking. <laughs> yeah, you you, you got to mail it to me. Um, all right, Frankie, you were starting to talk about about uses in cohorting and possibly other infection control applications, and and there's really some meat here. Um, mm -hmm. So take us take us through the the potential uses for infection control. Right. So uh, again, when we wrote this, it was pre uh, Delta, Delta, Delta. So you know, um, at the time, there was still a little bit more variety of um, the variants that were out there. But the thought is that you know, if hospitals have um, uh, patient rooms that are, you know, individual patient rooms, this may not be quite as big of an issue, but a lot of hospitals still have shared rooms, right? And, uh, you know, at least two beds, and in some cases, quad beds, for example. And so that might be a, a, a scenario where being able to know if your patients are all sharing the the same virus um, might might be important, especially if you're trying to track something like a, a hospital-based outbreak. So, uh, you know, it's one thing if you just, everybody's coming in from the community and you're just trying to keep cross-mixing, but if you had a scenario where you're like, gosh, did we actually do this to the person? Was this because employee X wasn't vaccinated, you know, whatever, um, being able to, to sort those out um, uh, to, to the level of the variants could be really helpful to do those investigations. So that was something that we thought would be helpful. And it, would that primarily be retrospective or could it be near real time? Um, <laughs> So uh, I'll kick that back to Alex again. I think it, it probably depends on how you're set up, you know, mm -hmm. and what your targets are. Well, I guess uh, so. We, people have used, obviously use the BioFire and other multiplex platforms for some of this cohorting from a species level standpoint. Right. But uh, so, I mean, in, in, in writing the, the the paper, there was a, a a group in Canada that actually done this. Mm -hmm. They had done yeah. a list of a qPCR uh, to identify specific variants to suggest for cohorting, and they did it. I mean, mm -hmm. it actually happened. It was not like a theoretical. It's not like we're sort of like grasping at you know sort of straws here for reasons to do this. It's like no, that was actually being done, and so you know that happened in the real world, and it it sort of it makes sense in a way if you don't know the a priori what the cross neutralization pattern of you know alpha versus beta versus delta versus gamma you know is going to be, um, and so it's, a, it's kind of an interesting you know certainly you could imagine that uh, as you get more platforms that have more genotyping information for instance rhinovirus would be a great one where if you actually get the serotype 
that someone was actually infected with their enterovirus. And that would sort of, you know, obviously it'd be better if we had, you know, individual patient rooms. Um, but it is, it is sort of those, that's a patient care application. And of course, then the infection prevention part is where we sort of get to, um, you know, very, very quickly next, because that is a truly a public health application mm -hmm. that you are in control of, that is you are responsible for in your own hospital. I want to go, sorry. Um, I want to go back to the application for real-time um, cohorting. I get it for influenza and RSV, right? You don't want to put a patient who has RSV in the same room as a patient who has influenza because one may catch the other's virus or, or both. But, and you, you touched on this, Alex, do we know for SARS-CoV-2 that there's a greater risk of a variant infecting somebody if you put two people together who have, who have different variants of the virus? Have we seen that? So, so there you're asking basically the sort of cross neutralization between one variant exactly. versus yeah. another. Um, yeah. and, and so that, that there's, you know, look, uh, COVID is relatively, um, it's pretty, pretty conserved. I'll tell you, 2 is relatively conserved at this time, sort of, you know, two years into its, uh, its, its time and spread in humans. And so the cross neutralization here between different variants is not so significant um, as to be uh, a major problem. Although you did see Delta, you see these breakthrough infections, and we have this sort of we have this developing thread, both from the mm -hmm. what, I, what I call the anatomical advantage of respiratory viruses and COVID, as well as sort of the the fast fusion and entry dynamics of Delta um, that allows it to sort of spread even faster. So so there are there are sort of I mean we can see this. We know that there are genotypic uh, determinants of of viral spread that you know may be less at, uh, one would be more or less advantageous and certainly as you go forward into the future as you if you get different lineages of of, of SARS-CoV-2 um then uh then that would allow you to have that like have that information but I agree this is a it was a sort of it, again we use this because it was done um mm -hmm. and because uh, uh it, it's something that you can get that genetic of information in a real time to influence patient care but yeah, do I see it as being a major use case going forward? You know, probably, probably not. Um, but it's, uh, uh, and we certainly, you know, we use this in, like you said, for RSV flu, H3N2 yep. versus H1N1, you could use that. Sure. Um, and again, like I would also throw in, I mean, keep, keep bringing up the rhinoviruses, but you know, that's where like we have, you have an analyte there that says rhino intero, which is really, you know, 250 different serotypes, 250 different viruses that are, are have, have limited cross neutralization against each other. All right, last last thing, um, and that is, um, as I mentioned at the beginning, this kind of sequencing has mainly been done in public health laboratories and research laboratories. Now it's being talked about for clinical laboratories. What's the relationship between the clinical lab and the public health lab in deciding who's going to do what? And as part of that, who's paying for this stuff? Can I can I bill the patient's insurance company for it? <laughs> I think right now, yeah, Frank, <laughs> I think take right now the answer um, is uh, not easily, um, and uh, and currently I don't know that we can at all actually for for sequencing. But going back to the first part of your question about who does this, right? If it should be um, a clinical slash, um, I'll say institutional versus public health. Um, I think it depends on the capacity of the public health laboratories um, because. You know, historically, this really has been much more of a, um, a public health uh, realm. But, you know, we've seen in this and in, in other previous outbreaks that, you know, the public health system can get overwhelmed pretty quickly, right? Because they're, they're really designed to focus on very narrow targeted outbreak situations where you can assess something, go in, control it, and try, try, to, try to get it, get it done and, and, and down versus something that is going to expand the entire country, you know, versus yep. in this case, the world, they're not, they're just not set up for that. And so it seems like trying to help them develop that partnership and, and where um, either commercial laboratories or, or, you know, in university labs and things like that, that do have the capacity to ramp up and to handle these things and also have built in expertise to do that. It seems like it could be a partnership. So who does it? Does it matter? You know, if they can mm -hmm. work together with the same goal and then, but fundamentally, you do have to pay your staff and you have to pay your reagents and you have to, you know, you have to be able to keep the lights on. And so where does the money come from? It seems like this should be, if, if, you know, we, we say that we're going to report these things into patient charts, then, then we should be able to bill for it. Now on the send of the payer, they're going to say, why do you, why I have to pay all of this money for this 
extensive molecular testing if it doesn't actually impact anything. Mm. And that's a that's a that's a fair argument too, right? Um, and so I think that it's it's probably going to take some more time to show that it matters and that it is useful. Um, and uh, you know, even if the even if the benefit is for something like cohorting, right? Um, uh, you know, even if that were the benefit, if you can say that by doing this, we prevent other people from getting infected, that's important, right? That's that's an important thing to still be able to pay for. But certainly if we show that by detection of certain variants, or sorry, mutations, you impact treatment decisions, then that is clearly a clinical application that needs to get paid for. And then the broader stuff, I feel like the government, the government, the, yep. the you know, the the they um, need to look at this um, from a societal level and sort of say, you know, if my if my public health lab doesn't just, ha it's not an expertise issue, it's just a volume and a capacity issue. If they can't do it, then let them partner with and let me consider this entire laboratory group as the public health lab, as long as they're maintaining the same standards. So, Alex, anything to, to add to that? Oh, yeah. Uh, how long do we have on this one? This is one of my favorite topics <laughs> right now, currently. Because if you're going into 2021, basically, U.S. was 43rd in the world in terms of sequencing SARS-CoV-2. And uh, the CDC turned to the nation's clinical labs, um, similar to how it happened with PCR, uh, for for expanding the capacity. Mm -hmm. And I use that clinical lab. I think it's LabCorp, it's Quest, it's you know, mm -hmm. UW, it's UCSF, it's, it's big. Uh, now they weren't all running it in CLIA, you know, fa CLIA fashion. They weren't running it in clinical, but they that is where we, that's how we achieve scale. Um, mm -hmm. in the United States is by involving large reference labs and clinical labs uh, in this in this kind of work. And so that's how we've, you know, rapidly increased our capacity for sequencing. That's through money from the CDC that Biden specifically you know, passed and gave money to the CDC and CDC did a lot more contracts. I love to see that. I would love to see that going forward for other things, um, because the, the big part, the big picture here, it's not just about COVID. It's not just about SARS-CoV-2. It's about it's an RNA virus. We can do this for other RNA viruses. Uh, we've shown the pharmaceutical pipeline, the vaccine pipeline is incredibly robust if we want to pay our attention to it. So we can do this, the same thing we've done with SARS-CoV-2, we can do with other viruses. We do the same thing with bacteria and fungi that are, you know, in your, in your lab, just DNA, shotgun sequencing, uh, hospital acquired outbreaks. There's a very, there's a lot that can be that is being brought on. And that's what's driving that interest. The other thing I would say around scale is that you really want to keep, I think you want to keep this, you have a compelling interest to keep this close to the patient. So we can talk about what they're doing exactly for clinical purposes and what's done for public health purposes, but I really would like to blend those a little bit more mm -hmm. because you want to keep that information close to the patient because otherwise it goes to the, to the public health lab and it, the information does not come back a lot of the time. And if you look, if you go to pathogen, NCBI pathogen detection right now and look at just some of the bacteria that, um, which is a great website, incredible tool that they've made for tracking bacterial infections for NCBI, you know, you go, you're looking at, there are over almost 20,000 clusters of salmonella and 20,000 clusters of E. coli and Shigella in the country. And ProPublica actually just wrote an article. They use pathogen detection to like literally trace something to like from a public interest standpoint. I mean, people can almost do this from home if you have someone sequence and you can work from it. So we don't have the scale of epidemiologists or people to investigate or people to look at this that we sort of, it takes a village now. And part of that mm -hmm. village are the physicians and the infectious disease physicians. And one last point here, which is that, you know, if you look at PCR from what happened with SARS-CoV-2, we have automated, pretty much everyone now has a sample to answer, you know, almost random access, fully automated instrument in their lab before or thanks to SARS-CoV-2. If you look at the long arc of sort of technology to sort of this, where we can have PCR for many different analytes available in a three to five hour turnaround time in lab, many, many labs across the country, uh, that was a 30 year process, right? From the PCR and qPCR and training a bunch of people, you know that every tech that walks in is gonna have some, should be able to go to the whiteboard and draw out what qPCR is and how it happens. They may not be able to design specific primers. Um, followed by the regulatory status. So whenever, when this comes out, everyone knows how to like, basically knows how to validate and how to think about qPCR. We're not there from sequencing. There's lots of pharmaceutical companies we can talk to or the people we talk to where it's still, they don't know, they just haven't done it. And, and so we're still early in this process, but this is part of the process of, match, of maturing that technology and getting it out in a more dispersed manner. So it's not just the CDC, it's not just the state public health lab, it's also in the clinical and, and, and working with your genetic colleagues to be able to do that. They're gonna take some technology improvements, they're gonna take some informatics improvements, but this is happening. And, and so I do think that there is an incentive, there is, there is a, a compelling interest in incentivizing this sort of technological uh, uh, phase shift um, you know, why not now? So, All right. But, on, anyway. that, on that, on that very optimistic, even idealistic note, Ooh. 
we're going to have to leave it there. <laughs> Frankie, thank you so much for joining us. Oh, thank you. And Alex, thanks for joining us. This has been great. Thanks so much. Thanks for not calling me naive. <laughs> <laughs> and thank you, listener, for listening.